so today we want to talk about covenant thinking. So in Isaiah chapter 54, we begin our text. So let's take a moment and pray, and we'll open up this way. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to direct my conversation with these beautiful people of yours, that you will help me speak exactly what is necessary and only what you would have them to hear today. It's so important that we hear the voice of the Lord and I'm praying that you will use me to speak your words in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in Isaiah 54 verse 9, we say, we see this, that as for this, and what is the this? This is the proposal of God to enter into covenant lifestyle. Now, you'd have to go back and read all of Isaiah 54. It's not a long read. I really encourage you to do so. It talks about the mindset and the condition of the children of Israel at that day. And he's speaking to them from that position. And he says, I know where you're at, but I want you to know something, how committed I am to you. As for this, it is as the waters of Noah unto me. For I have sworn, I've taken an oath, that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn. So in other words, I have now, I've sworn again, that I would not be wroth with you. I'm not going to rebuke you. I'm not going to be put out with you. And the Bible says, for the mountain shall depart, the hills shall be removed, but my kindness, everybody look at this term, but my kindness, my covenant love for you, my grace, my mercy, my deep passion for you shall never, shall never, shall never depart from thee. I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what decision you made. I don't care where you stand at right now. I'm telling you, you can feel like you're broke, busted, and disgusted. It doesn't change this fact. I'm committed to you. I'm not walking away from you. I'm not going into another camp. You're mine, and I'm forever sold out to you. Now, how can you be that type of person if you don't know that he's that type of God? We talk about we love his lordship, but if I love his lordship, then I have to understand that that lordship now propels me to be like him. So everybody around me then is, is now in a position to receive covenant love by me. That's my responsibility. But it should be that I get to participate in some covenant love because you've chosen me. And I've chosen you, and we've chosen each other. So we've made these promises. Hey, life can be tough. Toes can be stepped on. We may have some disagreements, but I ain't going nowhere. I am committed to you. But the world doesn't know that today. But he sets the standard. My kindness shall never depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. That word peace is about wholeness, completeness, about making you everything you dream about being from the standard of the word of God. And he says, and it's the Lord who's making this promise. And I want you to know something. You really don't deserve it, but I have mercy for you. (laughs) you None of us deserve it, but mercy flows on our behalf. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I believe that what we're seeing in covenant love is a proposal. It's like a young man getting on his knees and he now proposes to the beloved of his life, his his future bride, and says, would you take me? Would you have me to be your husband, your covering, your provider, your protection? Will you have me? And Jesus does that with every human being on the face of the earth. That proposal is out for everybody. But not everybody accepts the proposal. Listen, if if... At some point in our lives, if we're insecure, which a lot of us deal with insecurity, you understand that? A lot of us. I deal with insecurity sometimes. I have to deal with it in my own life. Why? I don't know. But it's just a part of what I have to fight through. But the issue comes down to this. There's nothing to be insecure about in life. Because the truth of the matter is, if my heart is fixed on my wife and, my, and her heart is fixed on me and I ain't looking for nothing else, then there ain't nothing else coming my way. God ain't looking for nobody else. His eyes are fixed on you. And he's making that promise. 
But Western civilization, do you know what Western, look, I got a note in there. Go to that right now. That in Western civilization, we talk about being civilized people. You know what the term civilized means? It's, it's the thought process is to be reclaimed from a savage lifestyle and manners. Civilized means that if, if you are born again and you are serving Christ, you know, there are people that actually believe that the scriptures are vulgar because there's blood and there's sensuality and there's all kind of stuff. So it's like if you're going to take pornography off the shelves of the kids that are in, for, in libraries, you got to take the word of God because they got bad stuff in it too. No, they don't. It's all about covenant love. But the civilized world says you need to be reclaimed from that savage type of lifestyle, those uh, historic type of manners. Because the more mankind becomes civilized, the further they move away from their commitment to his word. You know that the more that we become civilized, the more we become liars. The more we become civilized, the more my heart drifts away from him the more I become a truth breaker. Because the reality is that Father God, he, he, you are on the forefront of his thinking. He doesn't exist without you. You are him and he is you. It's so deeply woven in together, but we see ourselves broken and separated from him, but yet he's embraced us and brought us in. And if we don't transform the way we think about life, then we'll live our whole life in a lie. That I'm, I'm not secure in his love. No, you are secure in his love. Well, I, re- I really struggle with abandonment. Maybe he's going to abandon me, but he's promised that he won't. Right. And he's faithful. But I struggle with it. Well, stop it. Stop thinking that way. Well, I don't know how. Yeah, you do. Stop thinking that way. When you start thinking that way, replace it with words. Just say, no, I'm loved by the Lord. You know, people talk about, well, those people are insane. They talk to themselves. Yeah, you ought to talk to yourself a lot because you need a lot of correction. And the only way you can correct your, th- your, your thought process is with words, his word. Put his word in your mouth and correct the way you think. So the Lord, I believe, has invited us into a proposal, and he says, though you're broken, you're grieved, you're rejected, and I know your thoughts. Your thoughts is that you want to be in isolation. I know that your thoughts are that you're being forced into abandonment, but I want you to know that I'm compassion, and I'm calling out to you. I'm proposing myself to you. He says, I understand that you have these unchanging Views, You're not willing to change. And I know sometimes that frustrates me, but my covenant love drives me deeper and deeper for you. I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting to me. Oh, my God. He's, he's, not, he's not faithless. He's faithful. I mean, he's drawing us into a deeper love relationship or deeper love realities of what love is all, all about. You see, covenant thinking is about covenant love that touches every aspect of your life. The more we understand covenant and what it really means from God's perspective is that by knowing these truths, it will help you receive every need of your life with confidence. If you really understand that he's covenanted to you by blood, that's what Jesus did for you. Do you understand that you could not have entered into covenant because we couldn't pay the price? But Jesus came as man, and he represented every one of us, and he allowed his blood to be shed on our behalf, and he took that blood as the Lamb of God, presented unto the Father, signed a new contract with the Father, and we're in the deal. We are a part of the inheritance of Christ. The promises of God are yes and amen. Why isn't there greater victory in church? Because we still think like broken people. We still reason like broken people. We don't think like the redeemed. We don't meditate like the redeemed. We're we're like drug addicts. We're just drugged through life on a drug that is falsehood. 
So covenant not only gives you confidence to receive from the Father, but it strengthens every relationship in your life because you understand now I've made a promise to be with you forever and I want to tell you something. Sometimes that exceeds death. See, what do you mean? Well, I can remember sitting around a table with some of my friends and we made promises to one another that if anything happened to us, we would still protect and cover and take care of each other's spouses. We still take care of Miss Nell. We still take care of those who we've made promises with. We still walk with them. We didn't push them away. We still embrace them and bring them in. So how far does that go? Until she goes home. We made promises. And I take great delight in that. We haven't forsaken anybody. But it strengthens relationships. Covenant brings peace of mind knowing that you will never fail. Nothing has the power to destroy you. So it should bring joy within your soul. So I believe that a part of the example of covenant living is in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 says, Jesus says, I say this to you. So he's going to reveal to us kingdom truth in word. Why is this important? Because this is how you present to yourself kingdom truth by word. You are a prophet of your own life. You've got to take the word of God that it reveals to you, and you've got to start instructing yourself on your new outcome. It flows out of your spirit by truth from the word of God. It is empowered by your spirit to now be digested through your soul. But most people never take it into their soul. They never meditate on the word of God. They never think on the word of God. They think about their problems. They think about the bills. They think uh, all the things that the world tells them to think about. They worry. They fret. They're concerned. They got ulcers. They're broken, busted, disgusted. But they, they have power in their spirit, but they never exercise thought. On the scripture. They never take the promise of God as their own. So the result is their emotions are all over the place. They're unstable in every area of their life. They're born again, love Jesus, but they're flaky. So their will is not settled to carry out the will of God. So their soul is just still corrupted. But it has the ability to be delivered. You know what happens next? Once your, once your soul is positioned in righteousness, your body will fill up with light. So he says, I say these things to you. Take no thought. Do not worry for your life. Why do you sit here and be, why are you consumed with death and destruction? Why are you consumed with uh, inflation and everything else in life. Why are you so consumed with that? It's a great question. Why are you consumed? Why aren't you triumphing over all of it? Who is quiet in here? It must be that we worry a lot. We take thought about life. We are concerned about life. But he says, don't do it. So that means I need correction. He says, you worry about what you're going to eat. My God, I got to go to the store. There's $10 a gallon of milk. Yeah, but he says, don't worry about it. I don't know where I'm going to find my next outfit. I can't afford to buy a new suit. Why are you worried about it? He says, you know, you worried about eating, drinking, raiment. Why are you worried about this? And he answers this question. Is not the life more than? Isn't life more than what you're worried about? Isn't life more valuable than a piece of bread? Isn't your existence more important than what you're going to drink tonight? Isn't your existence more powerful than what you're going to, what kind of thread you got on you? Man, you can have a bust up, broken up, holy shirt, but you can carry the anointing of God to deliver a city. Doesn't matter what you got on the outside, it's who you carry on the inside. 
And you sitting here worried about all kind of frivial things. So isn't the body more important than your clothing? I mean, this body is what's keeping you in the earth. Now, I'm not telling you to worship your body, but I am telling you, if you want to stay in this fight, oh, well, let me put it this way. You want to stay in the struggle, and unfortunately, a lot of the church don't want to be in the struggle. You want to know why most of the problems are happening in our culture today? It's because the church took themselves out of the world, and they got their bags packed, and they're all sitting on the edge of the chair. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> Take me out. Take me out. And there's no witness, there's no prophetic word, there's no laying on of hands, there's nothing going on from a kingdom standpoint because we just want out. We got rapture fever. Now listen to me. If the rapture takes place, hallelujah. You understand that? So I'm not downgrading it, I'm talking about a mindset. All right. That was real popular. So he says in verse 26, so he says, so let me, let me make this point. I'm going to go back to this. Is not life more than meat, the body than raiment? And I believe what he's asking is, what's your value system? What is the value that you put on life? Is it about having a pocket full of money? Is it about having the big house? Look, all those things are wonderful. A lot of those things are just the reward of good work and the blessing of the Lord. I, I don't despise any of that stuff. I wish all of you have everything you want to have. But the value of that is nothing compared to the value of Jesus. He is the value. And then all the other stuff chases you down. All the cool stuff that you would like to have, it will run you down if you make him Lord. And you follow him. So he says, what's your value system? So verse 26, so it says, it says, so behold. And so I wrote this down. You can take it like you want. But why don't you use your imagination for something different? Behold. Take a look at something different. The fowls of the air. They don't sow. Neither do they reap. They don't even gather into barns. And they don't worry about nothing. Because they're dependent on the love system of God. They're dependent on the covenant that God has made with man in the earth. He says, because your father feeds them. He says, your father, your heavenly father, your heavenly father, your heavenly father, your daddy feeds them and you're worried about life? Your daddy. He didn't say their daddy. He said, your daddy. Your daddy feeds them, and you worry about stuff? He's so committed to you that he cares for everything around you so that it can bless you, and you worry about stuff? Because you don't understand covenant. You don't understand how deep his love is for you. You don't understand how much he wants to bless you and prosper you. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about in life. Where you go to bed at night at peace. No fear on you. No, no agitation on you. Nothing's on you except the Holy Ghost. So he says, or, and he answers this question. It's a great question. It's about our value system. Are you not much better than they? Come on, answer. You, you don't have to answer out loud, but you got to answer the question. Jesus is asking you a question. Are you better than creation because he created you to be look like him, to operate like him? Aren't you not better? So why have you reduced yourself below the birds of the air? Because they don't have to do nothing except trust the system. Amen. So which of you, by taking thought, which of you by worrying can add one cupid unto your stature or add one hour to your lifespan. In other words, it's not to say you cannot add time because you can redeem the time. But he says if you take worry, worry will add nothing to you. Matter of fact, it will take away from you. You see, worry is not covenant living. Fear is not covenant living. 
But Western people don't understand covenant because it costs too much. And liberty and freedom for us in this day, there's no accountability of what it cost previous generations to gather it for us. So it's like, well, I can just do whatever the hell I want to do. Now, excuse me, but I'm not cussing. I'm using terminology because it is real. Hell is real. So I can do whatever it tells me to do, and I'm going to live under the grace of God. Well, it's true. His love always is for you, but you do determine your outcome. You don't have to live with him forever. But his love will always be with you. <laughs> so he says, so why do you take thought, worry about raiment? Just consider, again, learn thoroughly and examine carefully. Consider well the lilies of the field, how they grow. I love that, how they grow. Well, they don't grow by worrying. They're not growing by worrying. You're not going to be mature in worry. They don't toil. They don't spin. And yet I say unto you, even Solomon and all of his glory was not even close to the beauty that's on them. Wherefore, if God will clothe the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow's cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? So great, another question, another question that you've got to answer from the deep wells of who you are, will he not clothe you? And then he says, so why do you live with such little faith? If you know all this stuff, why is there so little faith? Because we've never deal, dealt with the subconscious of what's going on in my inner world. I've never been a student of my inner world. I've never been responsible to change the inner world. But covenant love is telling us to do something. Relax and learn to respond to the provision of heaven. Saturate your life in God's reality and leaning and lean into his action. See, covenant love will always strengthen your ability to understand and take hold of the integrity of God's promises to his children. I want to show you this Isaiah chapter 54, verse 11. And I'm going to put this in my commentary. This is my commentary, but you can read it later. It's as if God is saying, I know your struggles. You're unstable in stubborn ways because you just don't want to change. But your foundations in Christ Jesus are beautifully established. And you really do have eyes to see the glory that's set before you. But you're stuck in your struggles. You're just stuck in your struggles. Because you've never went to work in identifying what's keeping you bound. There's nothing in the kingdom of darkness that keeps us bound. Jesus has redeemed us from all destruction. So then what is it? It's what's festering on the inside of me. It's my lust. It's my immorality. It's my desire for other gods, not him. He said, well, that's not true. I love Jesus. I understand we love Jesus, but we like a lot of other stuff first too. Now, I'm not yelling at you or preaching at you. I'm talking with you because I'm a guy fighting through my own struggles. I want you to understand that, but I'm on a mission to straighten this boy out. You know why? Because the corresponding action is glorious. All right, so for the sake of time, we're gonna, I'm going to mark this, but I want to hit one more point. Go to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, please. So Jesus makes this statement. He told them what they could expect for themselves if they followed him. And Jesus says this, anyone who intends to come with me <laughs> has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat anymore. 
I am. So don't run from suffering. You've got to embrace it. Now, what I mean by suffering is suffering to die to the corrupt man on the inside of me. To crucify that corrupt man on the inside of me. To identify my fears and my struggles and put them under the blood of Jesus. And to war a good fight with what's happening in me. I want to tell you something. There is no devil in hell that can conquer you that's on the outside world except the, the darkness that's inside you. It's what's keeping us down. So he says, don't run from suffering. Embrace change. Follow me, Jesus says, and I'm going to show you how. Now look at this statement. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way of really finding yourself, your true self. Now let me show you the outcome if we're ever really willing to do this. Isaiah 54, 17. <laughs> I love this. No weapon. No weapon that has been set on the inside of me. No lie that has been told to me since I've been a little kid. No deception that came to me through a movie. No deception that was told to me from a bully on the playground. No deception. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper if I do it his way. Identifying that old man and start putting him under my feet. So every tongue, every conversation that goes on in my head that's unrighteous, that rises up against me in judgment, you shall condemn it. You're going to do a warfare. You're going to have to go to fight, and you're going to have to enter into the struggle to change you. And he says, and if you do that, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is now of me. So I'm telling you guys, Somewhere along the line, we've got to get busy. This takes me right back to that word that the Lord gave me. He says this, prepare for your visitation. As I draw near, you will begin to notice a change in the way you see life, how to approach my holiness, and how to direct your soul. The victory is really in your soul being guided by your spirit and directed into truth. Truth will set your internal world straight and will fill your life with my light. Man, this is good stuff. I hope it's good for you. I'll tell you what, it just it brings me delight to know that he is totally sold out to me and for me. And he doesn't want me staying in the pit anymore. He wants me to come into the palace, his palace, and to, and to sit with him in heavenly places and to have dominion. Listen, listen. What, what, how are you going to have dominion over the stuff around you if we don't have dominion over the guy on the inside of you? Well, I'm just going to speak to the storm and command it to die. Wonderful. What about the fear that rages on the inside of you? What about the anxiety of why you can't sleep and you're on antidepressants? What about that struggle? You overcome that, and there's nothing out there that can't stop you from doing anything. All right, stand up before I get in trouble. Mm -hmm.